The land of Egypt has been a site of monumental discoveries over the past few centuries. With a history stretching back at least 5,000 years, the ancient Egyptians left behind a treasure trove of discoveries for archaeologists, many of which challenge our understanding of history and ancient societies. And it's happened again. Scientists just found the tomb of the Egyptian god Osiris right next to the River Nile, and it shocked everyone. Join us as we take a closer look at the land of the Nile and how its unbelievable discoveries are leading scientists to question their strongest beliefs. Fascination with ancient Egypt is by no means a modern innovation. Even the ancient Greeks looked at their neighbors across the Mediterranean with awe. For the Egyptians already had mighty pyramids thousands of years before Plato and Aristotle began pondering the meaning of life. Perhaps the most important Egyptian archaeological of all is the Valley of Kings. Located at the heart of the Theban necropolis just outside modern-day Luxor, the Valley of Kings served as the final resting place for some of the most powerful pharaohs in ancient Egypt. One of these pharaohs, King Tutankhamun, was widely believed to have led a sickly life. However, his ancient tomb revealed unexpected details about the boy king. Theories about his life have been called into question after the discovery of well-worn leather armor, indicating that King Tut was fit enough to see the heat of battle during his lifetime. Yet another burial site gave archaeologists rare insights about Tutankhamun's mysterious queen, Ankesanamun, including her long-lost mummy. Most shockingly of all, archaeologists found a tomb that might answer a mystery over 5,000 years old, the location of the tomb of the Egyptian god, Osiris. Among the many aspects of ancient Egypt that scholars obsess over to this very day, their peculiar religious traditions stand out. Chief among these myths is the story of the ancient Egyptian god, Osiris. In a shocking turn of events, archaeologists discovered a burial site that might be the long-lost tomb of Osiris himself. Discovered in the Theban necropolis Luxor, this tomb bears a striking resemblance to the mythical tomb that houses the powerful Egyptian god. It even contains a figure of Osiris, and its design bears all the hallmarks of the tomb described in the ancient legend. Could this actually be the tomb of Osiris, or perhaps of the individual that inspired his myth? After all, the foundation of many myths lay in the deeds of regular men. These tales are gradually made more fantastical over the passing of centuries, with storytellers and listeners adding embellishments to suit their cultural contexts. Whatever the case may be, this discovery might turn the entire field of Egyptology on its head. After all, the ancient god presided over many aspects of Egyptian life, ranging from death and the afterlife all the way to fertility. It's rather uncommon for an ancient deity to cover such a wide swath of important natural phenomenon. Zeus was the god of thunder, as was Thor. Ares was the god of war, Aphrodite the goddess of love, and Athena the goddess of wisdom. While each of these deities had multiple layers of complexity, none came close to Osiris. That just goes to show, Osiris was an especially important god for the ancient Egyptians. Not only did he represent the fertility of the Nile, which was arguably the single most important factor that allowed Egyptian society to rise up, but he was also the god of the afterlife. For those that don't know, the ancient Egyptians saw life on this plane as fleeting and unimportant. The one thing they desired most of all was to enjoy a pleasant afterlife, and Osiris was the bridge that connected them, as well as the god that showed them the secrets of resurrection. As the story goes, Osiris was once a great ruler of Egypt. His lineage extended all the way back to the mythical creator of the world, Ra and he presided over Egypt with his wife Isis by his side. Osiris and his brother Set were both the children of the god of earth, Geb, and the goddess of the sky, Nut. Isis was also the child of these two powerful gods, so Osiris technically married his own sister. While that might sound unsettling to modern listeners, evidence suggests that it wasn't entirely uncommon in ancient Egyptian society, at least among the elites. Now Set is traditionally thought to be the Egyptian god of violence and chaos, so it's unsurprising that he killed his brother Osiris in the myth. This represented the fundamental struggle of order and chaos, of good and evil, and it lay the foundation for many similar myths over the next few millennia. Set essentially fooled his brother, having him enter a box which he then flung into the Nile, assuming that it'd be lost forever in its murky depths. Of course, Isis was forever loyal to her husband, so she was able to discover his body. While all of this was happening, Set took advantage of the chaos and seized the throne of Egypt for himself. He ruled over Egypt with an iron fist, and when he was out hunting one day, he came across the body of Osiris underneath the tree. 
Acting on his violent impulses, Set chopped his brother's body into 14 pieces and hid them away in the farthest corners of Egypt. Once again, Isis showed her loyalty to her husband, working tirelessly until all but one of the pieces were found. This soul-missing piece was actually rather important, for it was Osiris's phallus. Unfortunately, a catfish had eaten it just before Isis was able to recover it, so the goddess created a new phallus out of gold before preparing him for burial. Upon seeing her devotion, the other Egyptian gods such as Thoth, god of healing, and Anubis, god of embalming, were quite impressed. They helped her to restore Osiris somewhat, with Anubis teaching her how to wrap up his body, which gave rise to the iconic ancient Egyptian practice of mummification. That said, Osiris could never fully return to the land of the living. Instead, his physical form was left in a tomb, but because he was embalmed, he could take his place as the ruler of the Duat, the land of the dead. Eventually, Horus would eventually become the chosen one that would defeat Set and restore order to Egyptian society. Throughout all of this, Osiris lay in his tomb, watching from beyond the veil of death and ruling over those that pass through for the rest of eternity. Of course, all of this is likely mythical exaggeration. Gods and monsters in ancient myths only exist to help rationalize aspects of the world that prehistoric humans couldn't fully understand. The tale of Osiris was probably created to explain a tradition of mummification that already existed in society, yet it still has roots that stretch back thousands of years before the historical record. Could there be some small kernel of truth to this mythological narrative? Perhaps, perhaps not, but that tomb discovered near Luxor may hold some of the answers. To be more specific, it was found in the Theban necropolis, where some of the most powerful officials of the New Kingdom period were buried. They comprised mighty rules who reigned from approximately 1,600 to 1,100 BCE, or about three to three and a half thousand years ago. She found his remains interwoven into a tamarind tree, which was another sign of his divinity. Using some sort of ancient spell, Isis was able to revive her husband, though he only stayed alive long enough for one last moment of intimacy with his wife. Through this act of intimacy, another great Egyptian god named Horus was born but Osiris quickly departed from the land of the living once more. The team behind this discovery included researchers from some of the most prestigious Spanish and Italian universities, and they were led by Dr. Maria Milagros Alvarez Sosa. Carbon dating revealed that the tomb was from anywhere between 700 to 500 BCE or the 25th and 26th dynasties of ancient Egypt. Now that might make it seem like the Osiris rumors are entirely false, but there's still a bit of evidence to suggest that it is, in fact, the tomb of Osiris. For one thing, the first historical record we have of the Osiris myth came from the Roman historian Plutarch, who lived between 46 and 119 AD. There are some glimpses of the Osiris myth before Plutarch's record, but they are sparse and fragmented to say the least. This leaves a centuries-long gap before the founding of the ancient tomb and Plutarch's comprehensive record of the story. There's a chance that the Osiris myth is actually not as old as previously thought. 700 years is a long time, more than enough for a story to turn into a myth and shape the religion of all Egyptian people. At first, it seemed like these archaeologists had stumbled across a tomb that would have belonged to the ancient Egyptian god of the afterlife. There was plenty of evidence to suggest this was the case, but unfortunately, Closer inspection revealed that it likely belonged to another high-ranking government official. Regardless, there was still a lot to ponder over about this recently discovered tomb. For one thing, it seemed to contain terrifying paintings of demons which were meant to protect the buried official according to Dr. Sosa. Perhaps most importantly, the tomb was covered with symbols that were meant to represent the original tomb of Osiris. It's hard to deny that the Egyptian god of the afterlife and king of the Duat served as a major inspiration for the tomb. Indeed, one could even say that the tomb was a direct recreation of Osiris's final resting place. So where did these ideas even come from? Well, there is an even more ancient burial site that it drew from, namely, the Osirian. Unlike the more recent tomb which likely saw its origins in the 25th dynasty, the Osirian came into existence many centuries prior during the 18th dynasty. While Egypt has no shortage of glorious tombs, the Osirian might be the grandest of all. No other tomb or pyramid in all of Egypt could come close to its grandeur, which led many to theorize that it was the final resting place of the god Osiris himself. Discovered in 1902 by Flinders Petrie and Margaret Murray, the Osirian sparked a wave of obsession with all things Egypt. 
Furthermore, the 18th dynasty origin is still just a theory, since there's no concrete way to figure out its true age. The tomb might have been built even further back in time, with architectural features which lay the groundwork for many more burial complexes along the Nile. It's hard to deny the link between the new tomb found in the Theban necropolis and the Osirian. Similar themes are present in both tombs, so whoever's buried there could have been an official that wanted access to the afterlife. The practice of embalming was largely meant to secure one's place in the Duat, ensuring everlasting life under the reign of Osiris. Both the Theban tomb and the Osirian contain statues on artificial islands. In the case of the Osirian, a structure of stone rose up from a water basin approximately 35 feet deep. Some theorize that the body of water served as a well, but it's far more likely that it symbolized how Osiris first rested after Isis recovered him along the banks of the Nile. Most theories about Osiris suggest that he was buried on an island, but that's not necessarily literal. Ancient Egyptians used symbols in all walks of life, including in their myths and legends. That's why the Osirian's place in history is still so difficult to nail down. As for the Osirian-inspired tomb in the Theban necropolis, it too contained an artificial island of sorts, with this one featuring a statue of the Egyptian god. Several pictures of the god Osiris adorned the walls as well, showing him with his skin as green as an emerald and the traditional pointy beard of the pharaohs. He's also holding his customary symbols like the crook and flail, with the crook representing how a king is the shepherd of his people, and the flail serving as a symbol for the fertility of the land. The presence of these specific tributes to Osiris is an intriguing element of the tomb outside of Luxor. It couldn't be mere coincidence, and it's backed up by numerous other similarities that bind it and the Osirian together. What's more, the body of the deceased was located directly beneath the statue, suggesting a deep connection that researchers have failed to uncover so far. Apart from the island-like structure, both tombs also feature an empty corridor that might symbolize a river. Since their society was so dependent on the Nile, the ancient Egyptians were fond of river symbolism, using it to mark some of their holiest sites. It's one thing to use certain symbols to mark one's devotion to a god, but to copy the Osirian so specifically is another matter entirely. What status did the entombed person hold in Egyptian society? Could he have been a pharaoh lost to the historical record? Or perhaps a holy man who held a unique connection to the god of the afterlife? The mystery didn't end there, for the tomb contained several secret passageways, several of which have yet to be excavated. A staircase beneath the chamber is likely a symbolic passageway to the underworld, and to the west of the statue, a corridor leading to a series of empty rooms added fuel to the fire. Within this western room in the tomb, a deep passageway was found which descended as much as 22 feet into the ground. Four more rooms were attached to this descending passageway, and despite their best efforts, archaeologists haven't been able to make heads or tails of it. Two of these rooms are completely empty, though it's uncertain whether they contained treasures which were looted by grave robbers throughout history. As for the other two rooms, they were completely covered with debris, and so archaeologists were unable to enter it without heavy-duty excavating machines. The use of these machines in such an ancient tomb could bring the entire structure crashing down, so we may never find out what secrets it held. This begs the question, what were all of these extra rooms even for? Ancient pharaohs were often buried with their wealth so that they could use it in the afterlife, but this particular tomb in the Theban necropolis seemed mostly empty. Again, grave robbers have long favored Egyptian tombs for their treasures and relics, but this tomb seemed almost hidden away between the various other sites in the necropolis. If it took archaeologists so long to discover it, how could grave robbers and thieves have found their way into it? The individual buried in the Theban necropolis tomb inspired by the Osirian could just be one of many that wanted to pay tribute to Osiris and his tale, and this points to just how little we know about Egypt and its history. Ancient Egyptian society first started out over 5,000 years in the past. Indeed, this was when they'd already started building the great pyramids we've all seen in the history books, so chances are that the Egyptians came into being thousands of years before this. It takes a lot of labor and resources to work on a vanity project like the pyramids, so it stands to reason that the ancient Egyptians had become a mighty political power prior to commencing the construction of the pyramids. In all that time, Egyptian society changed dramatically time and time again. It went from being a purely Nile-based agricultural society to becoming greatly Hellenized following the conquests of Alexander the Great, eventually seeing even more social upheaval as it was Islamicized centuries later.
What's frustrating is that the Osiris and inspired tomb in the Theban necropolis is the strongest link we have seen so far. It could connect the dots between the 18th and 25th dynasties and perhaps even shed some light on what ancient Egyptian society was like prior to the New Kingdom period. For those that don't know, the 18th dynasty marked the beginning of the so-called New Kingdom period. This was when Egypt reached the height of its powers, exercising enormous influence over its surrounding areas. The previously mentioned Theban necropolis almost exclusively served the elite of the New Kingdom, with the Osirian serving as its crown jewel. The high concentration of eye-popping burial sites might also indicate that the Egyptians of the New Kingdom period venerated this particular spot along the Nile. Returning to the recently discovered tomb, it reveals that the themes present in the Osirian continued to hold sway for hundreds of years. Just imagine, centuries passed between its construction and the creation of the smaller tomb in the necropolis, yet they seem to have nearly identical aesthetic features. Just for context, this would be like someone in the 21st century getting buried like Tamerlane the Conqueror. Clearly, the person buried in the Osirian was among the most inspirational and power individuals in all of human history perhaps even equaling religious figures like Jesus Christ. Yet we know hardly any details about his life, or even if he was a man in the first place. After all, there have been several female rulers of the Egyptian kingdoms throughout history, such as Hatshepsut, who ruled from 1479 to 1458 BC during the New Kingdom period. Now there's another New Kingdom ruler whose mysterious life holds many secrets about this period, and he may be the key to understanding the Osirian, the tomb in the Theban necropolis it inspired, and even ancient Egypt as a whole. We're talking about the one and only Tutankhamun, better known as King Tut, who's arguably the single most famous Egyptian pharaoh of all. Many know him as the so-called Boy King, which makes sense considering he was roughly eight or nine years old around the time he ascended to the throne. That said, new evidence has come to light that might completely change the narrative. You must understand, Tutankhamun holds a unique place in the field of archaeology and Egyptology. He's one of the few Egyptian pharaohs whose tomb remained largely intact before it was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922. The almost pristine interior of the tomb revealed deep insights about Egyptian burial practices, becoming a hotbed of research in the process. Some of the most important details discovered at the tomb had to do with the body of the pharaoh itself, which was preserved through mummification. You see, genetic analysis of Tutankhamun's remains revealed that he likely had a genetic illness that made his bones wither away. As if that wasn't enough, the disease causes numerous deformities such as a club foot that would have made it impossible for the ancient pharaoh to move around freely. This led many to theorize that the boy king led a sickly life, and his relatively short reign seems to support that. Despite ascending to the throne at just nine years of age, Tutankhamun only remained king for around a decade until he suddenly died. Since there aren't any surviving records of the 18th dynasty, the jury's still out on Tutankhamun's cause of death. It wasn't until genetic analysis that we learned of his terrible illness, and it stands to reason that this is what caused him to die at such a young age. Bear in mind, Tutankhamun was a great king, so he probably had access to the most skilled medical professionals of that era. Only a mysterious illness could have laid him low before he even reached his 20th birthday and chances are that he struggled with the illness for his entire life. However, research of Tutankhamun's tomb is still ongoing, and new discoveries arise almost every year. Recently, archaeologists uncovered a surprising object that might completely refute the theory that he lived a sick and weak life. This discovery was an armored leather vest, one that would have only been worn by a soldier in conflict. Now, ancient pharaohs were buried with all sorts of objects. And if Tutankhamun truly was plagued with an incurable illness, the leather vest might have been aspirational in a way. It could have served as a safeguard for the boy king to use in the afterlife, yet this theory went out the window as well when the vest was closely inspected. A notable expert on ancient Egyptian leather, Lucy Skinner, revealed that the vest showed signs of abrasion. Mind you, this isn't just the regular wear and tear that can occur over time. Rather, the vest had clearly been used time and time again, with the abrasions suggesting armed combat. It's fairly unlikely that Tutankhamun would have been buried with someone else's used armor. He was the ruler of Egypt after all, so the people burying him would either have placed a brand new leather vest next to his corpse, or perhaps a vest that he'd worn himself at some point or another. 
How could such a sick child have taken part in combat, that too with heavy-duty armor? Leather cuirasses are only worn by soldiers on the vanguard, the ones that take part in the heat of battle. After the discovery of this new leather armor, as well as the analysis that revealed how well-worn it was, a new theory started to emerge. Tutankhamun might have been a child soldier. That makes sense if you consider he was the head of the formidable Egyptian military apparatus. The new kingdom made inroads as far south as Ethiopia, becoming a powerful colonizer of northern Africa throughout the Bronze Age and beyond. The notorious sea peoples that laid waste to Mesopotamia were helpless in the face of Egypt's military might, so any pharaoh that ascended to the throne needed to prove himself in battle. It's not just the vest that suggests Tutankhamun saw the horrors of warfare either. The boy king was also buried alongside a dagger, and when it was put under the microscope, researchers discovered something truly baffling. The dagger initially appeared to be made of iron, but it had a peculiar chemical makeup that was entirely different from regular earth-based iron ore. It had an unusually high amount of nickel and cobalt in the blade, and there's only one place where this type of iron shows up, in a meteorite. Sure enough, when the dagger's blade was put through further analysis, researchers found that it definitely came from a meteorite. Ancient Egyptians certainly saw falling meteors with reverence, much like any other contemporary society. They had no framework to understand these falling stars, and any material harvested from them would have gone to the most powerful people in the land, namely the pharaoh. However, Tutankhamun's cosmic dagger is a great gift even by pharaonic standards. This was long before advanced smelting processes had been invented. The simple act of mixing tin and copper to produce bronze was seen as a revolutionary technological advancement, and bronze was widely considered to be the most powerful material of all. That's not to say that iron didn't exist, of course. It's just that smelting and reworking iron was quite a bit more difficult than crafting bronze. Other precious metals like gold were relatively easy to melt down and shape into various objects, but iron was a particularly tough nut to crack by all accounts. And when you add its unique molecular composition to the mix, the existence of Tutankhamun's knife suggests that ancient Egyptian society was far more advanced than previously thought. The fact that he lived so close to the creation of the Osirian suggests a link between Tutankhamun and the tomb of Egypt's greatest god. There's no concrete evidence for who's buried there, and King Tut himself was in a separate location in the Valley of Kings, so what sort of ruler trumped the wielder of a cosmic blade? There's another enduring mystery that makes the tale of the Tutankhamun, Osirian, and the 25th dynasty tomb it inspired even more convoluted. It centers around an individual that few people even know about, Tutankhamun's wife, Ankhazenamun. Now, much like Osiris and Isis were born to the same parents, Tutankhamun and Ankhazenamun were likely brother and sister as well. Indeed, this may have been a step up for the new queen, for she'd allegedly been married to her own father prior to becoming Tutankhamun's bride. Such pairings were by no means unusual for the ancient Egyptians, for they were trying to preserve bloodlines to maintain a connection with their primordial deities. It must have made for a poor genetic makeup, potentially even causing genetic defects such as the ones found in Tutankhamun's remains. Throughout the 20th century, we only knew of Ankesenamun's existence through historical documents such as the Hittite letters, which were exchanged between her and Supaluliuma, queen of the Hittites. However, several tombs have been discovered which may belong to Ankesenamun herself. The first tomb is located fairly close to Tutankhamun's, which lends credibility to the notion that it belongs to his wife. The tomb contained jewelry, clothing, and a number of coffins, along with pottery fragments bearing the name Paten, which may be derived from Ankesenamun's original name, Ankesenpaten. She's the only individual in Egyptian history to bear that name. But there's a catch. Researchers couldn't find any mummies in it. Where could the ancient queen have gone? Well, a pair of mummies were found in the Valley of Kings in 2010, and one of them is almost certainly Ankesenamun. One of these mummies has DNA that is nearly identical to the 18th dynasty line, and current efforts are underway to compare her genetic makeup to the two fetuses of Tutankhamun's daughters that were buried with him. This has led some to theorize that the queen was possibly disinterred at some point after her potential mummy was located so far from her tomb seems to suggest that her husband, King Tut, didn't like her initial resting place and wanted to find something more suitable. This puzzling event creates some interesting parallels with the tale of Osiris himself, 
for the god of the afterlife was also taken away from his first resting place. It seems like the deeper we go, the more mysteries we come up with. Answers always seem to be out of reach, and there's no telling what other puzzling details scientists will uncover in the Valley of Kings. Maybe the next discovery will reveal why the Osirian was able to inspire a tomb constructed so many centuries later, or perhaps it'll further confuse researchers and remind them how far they still are from the truth. Do you think there could really be a connection between Tutankhamun, Enkazanamun, and Osiris? Let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to leave a thumbs up if you liked this video, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.